from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Library of Congress and to this event, a conversation about the novel Un Paese di Carta. I am Grant Harris. I'm head of the European Reading Room here at the Library of Congress, not in this building, the Madison, but in the Jefferson across the street. The, the library is very pleased to sponsor this event today, and we do so in partnership with the library's Italian language table and more importantly with the Italian Embassy, the Italian Cultural Institute, and especially with the author, Dr. Laura Benedetti from Georgetown University, and reporter Emily Langer of the Washington Post. The novel we will discuss today has many interesting facets, but let me add one to that. The novel refers to an area in central Italy called Abruzzo, which neighbors the area struck by the earthquake just a week ago, Abruzzo, and in particular its major city, L'Aquila, from which Dr. Benedetti hails, was hit by an equally devastating earthquake in 2009. The Library of Congress is proud of its Italian collections, possibly the largest such collections outside of Italy. Lucia Wolf, uh, sitting in the front row, is our specialist for Italy, and if you want to research nearly any aspect of Italy, please come back and talk to Lucia anytime. In just a minute, I will have Lucia introduce today's speakers. Uh, I'll hold forth for just another minute here. Uh, let me say that we hope you enjoy the discussion today and that you will come back to use our collections. Again, I thank all who have made this event possible. I would now invite to the podium the library's Italian specialist, Lucia Wolf. Okay, so I'm going to have to do something here. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So I am Lucia Wolf, and I'm the reference library librarian for the Italian collections at the European Division. Today's event is a very special occasion, the presentation of Dr. Laura Benedetti's first novel, Un Paese di Carta. I will leave it to her to translate the title in English. I had something uh, approximately a country of paper, but it could be a town of paper too. But to an American audience, the most important thing for me is the promotion of Italian culture and language through our vast Italian collections at the Library of Congress, which I am very proud to say is close to 400,000 items, although it is impossible to come up with, a <laughs> with an exact count. Um, the promotion of the Italian collections is one of the most important and exciting parts of my profession because it allows for the connection between the collections and the communities that the library serves. Um, as Grant mentioned, the Library of Congress is one of the few, uh, very, the few libraries in the world with the largest number of Italian items in its collections. These hundreds of thousands of items are spread across all divisions and come in all formats, prints and photographs, music scores, manuscripts, maps, sound recordings, motion pictures, uh, in addition to the large number of printed books and periodicals. Um, Dr. Benedetti's novel, the subject of our presentation today, is one of the many books written by interesting contemporary Italian authors in our general collections. And for the Americans in our audience, I might add that many English translations of Italian authors are also present in our vast collections. Uh, the Italian holdings at the Library of Congress increase by the thousands every year with new items from Italy's current publishing scene, of which Dr. Benedetti's novel is one. Personally, I can attest to this because I have, I have the honor to be the person who selects and recommends the new acquisitions from Italy. Uh, thank you all for allowing me this short promotion of the Library of Congress's collections to elicit, elicit your interest and patronage. Now to our guest speaker. 
Dr. Laura Benedetti holds a laurea summa cum laude from the University of Rome La Sapienza, a master's from the University of Alberta, and a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. She taught for eight years at Harvard, where she was uh, the John Loeb, Loeb mm -hmm. Associate Professor for the Humanities before joining Georgetown in 2002. Um, her publications include La sconfitta di Diana, un percorso per la Gerusalemme liberata, The Tigress in the Snow, Motherhood and Literature in 20th Century Italy, the edition and translation of one of Italy's earliest women writers, Lucrezia Marinella, Esortazioni alle donne e agli altri, and most recently, Un paese di carta. Incidentally, all of these books by Dr. Benedetti are in the library's collections. She has been the guest of honor at annual meetings of the American Association of Italian Studies, as well as the recipient of various awards. The Flaiano International Prize for Italian Studies, the Wise Woman Award from the National Organization of Italian American Women, and the gold medal from the Federazione Associazioni Abruzzesi USA. She is currently associate editor and book review editor of Italian Culture, the journal of the American Association of Italian Studies. Our next guest speaker is Emily Langer, a reporter with the Washington Post where she works on the obituaries desk and says about her work. Every day I have the opportunity to delve into a different life, a writer, a scientist, an artist, a doctor, and so on. She also writes occasionally feature stories for the newspaper, including two articles about a pair of Italian sisters who survived the Holocaust as very young girls. Finally, she is a graduate of the Italian department at Georgetown University, and in 2010-2011 was a Fulbright Fellow in Trieste, Italy. And now I will leave you to our presentation. Thank you all. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Thank you to Lucia and to Grant for having us. Uh, but most of all, thank you, Laura, for writing this magnificent book. Um, I was Laura's student 14 years ago at the, at the Italian department of Georgetown. And uh, it was my first day at Georgetown and her first day at Georgetown. And I stumbled into her class about the Italian writer uh, Italo Calvino, who, by the way, figures in this novel. and. I've been hanging around ever since. So I'm very, uh, very glad to be here with her today. Um, so as, as Grant said, uh, Laura is from L'Aquila, which you probably remember was hit by a terrible earthquake in 2009. And I wanted to ask you first, um, given what you know about L'Aquila's experience, what does Amatrice face in the next uh, number of years recovering from the earthquake last, last week? Well, what, what I'm here, well, first of all, L'Aquila is only, uh, only 30 miles from Amatrice, so the quake uh, brought back some very sad memories and also created some new damage in L'Aquila as well. Uh, as far as Amatrice is concerned, of course, there the devastation is uh, terrible, but I hear of a strong determination from the people of Amatrice to, to rebuild their town. And now I also hear from the government that the model that was followed for L'Aquila, so the idea of closing off the town and building somewhere else is not a model to be followed in this case. And this is very reassuring to me, so I hope that uh, uh, in a way the experience, uh, the tragic experience of the L'Aquila earthquake will help <coughs> the people in Amatrice to rebuild faster and better homes. And incidentally, uh, Amatrice was part of the of L'Aquila territory until 1927. Mm -hmm. There is a very powerful link between the two communities. And in fact, uh, I just read in the paper today that uh, several families from Amatrice just arrived in L'Aquila and will be housed really? in the houses that were built for the uh, after the earthquake in L'Aquila. So there is a very strong uh, link between the two communities. What is the situation in L'Aquila today? Uh, six years, seven years after the earthquake? Well, what, in, in the past uh, two years, let's say, since, since 2014, things have really changed, and uh, the rebuilding of the town has had a very 
powerful acceleration. So actually, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about the future of the town. There are mm, several question marks, especially in terms of the, what the population is going, is going to do, because many people have left L'Aquila, many people, especially after what happened in Amatrice, don't feel safe in the center of town. So there are still uh, many, <laughs> many issues to be to be discussed and, and many problems to be solved. But I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a friend after the, the earthquake last week, and what he said was that in the United States, we tend to think of Italy for its beauty and for its history, and that what these earthquakes have exposed is also its fragility. And I wanted to ask you about the title mm -hmm. of your novel, uh, as they said, Un Paese di Carta, uh, which relates to this. What did you mean with your title? Yeah. Uh, First of all, uh, uh, thank you, Lucia, and thank you, Grant, and thank you, Emily. This, this is wonderful. Thank you all for, for being here. The, uh, but it's very, <laughs> it's very interesting that uh, uh, Lucia immediately brought up the issue of the title, because the title is very hard to translate into, into English, and it turned out to be more ambiguous than I thought even in Italian. Uh, in my mind, so in, the, in the mind of the artist, the, 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 the title meant Italy as a cultural and especially literary construction as opposed to, liter to Italy as a political uh, and physical entity. So in other words, the, the one of the protagonists of the novel is a woman who left Italy uh, at the end of the 50s and has lived the rest of her life in the United States, but has kept a very strong relationship with Italy. But Italy, the Italy that she loves, is un paese di carta, is a country made of paper, in the sense that it lives in books, it lives in its cultural artifacts. It does not, it's not Italy as a political uh, entity. Uh, there is only one, uh, one passage in the novel where this, uh, uh, this expression uh, uh, is mentioned, and it is precisely when Alice, so the, the, the oldest of the three women, the, the, the novel is about three women, the oldest one is Alice, and Alice is writing a letter to her fiancé in Italy explaining that she'll never go back. And she says, but that, that, does, not, that does not matter because I will always inhabit the Italy I love, a country made of paper. But uh, when I presented the book, because I've had the chance to, to present the book all over during the past year, from Naples to Venice uh, and Torino, and when I presented it in L'Aquila, especially I presented it in, in, uh, in several schools in L'Aquila, and when I uh, asked about uh, the, the meaning of the title, the answer I, I got the, the, the most often was it's a fragile country, it's a vulnerable country, it's a country that uh, is, uh, seems very solid but could collapse at any minute. And uh, I, I think there is really an interference of the experience of the earthquake which uh, taught us that, uh, that uh, um, fragility. But it's very it's very interesting to me that now, for the first time yesterday, actually, when we uh, posted uh, something on Facebook, uh, I also, uh, since this is the first presentation of the novel in English, so I uh, commented on uh, Emily's <coughs> post and I said, yes, this is the first presentation in English, which brings up the issue, how to translate the title. And uh, uh, actually, somebody answered in private, because we're mostly Italians answer. And one of, one of them said, you know, forget about uh, Un Paese di Carta altogether and uh, focus on something like, she's back. She's back home. And so I was thinking that going home, although it's completely different, could, could, be, a possible, could be a possible title. But anyway, the title is, is yeah, was central in my, in my way of thinking about the book when I started writing it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a challenging title. So you mentioned that the book is about three women. Uh, mm -hmm. So Alice is the oldest, then uh, Alice's daughter is Jane, and Jane's daughter is Sarah. So Sarah is Alice's granddaughter. And uh, mm -hmm. three generations of women over 50 years, more than 50 years, from World War II, all the way up until the aftermath of the, uh, the earthquake in L'Aquila. So the first character we meet is Sarah. 
Tell us about Sarah. Yeah, it's hard to talk about Sarah uh, without talking about the other two. So the, the, the oldest one uh, is the only one who has a clear birth date and also a death date in the novel is Alice. Alice was born in 1913 in L'Aquila and dies in Bethesda uh, in, 2000, in 2010. She left Italy in 1957 and she had a daughter, Jane. Jane in turn had three children, but especially had this one daughter, uh, Sarah, who is 18 when the novel begins in, in 2010. She's multilingual, uh, very bright, um, very sensitive, and a little bit of a mess when the, when the novel begins. So the novel, in a way, is also the, the Bildungsroman the, uh, of Sarah. So it's a novel of formation, a, a young protagonist uh, manages to overcome the challenges on her path and enter adulthood uh, to, a center, to a certain extent because I'm a little skeptical about drastic resolutions but the Sarah at the end of the novel is much stronger than the Sarah we meet at the beginning. One more thing about Sarah, Sarah was born when her mother Jane uh, thought she had had enough of uh, raising children and was ready to start her career as a, as a lawyer. So uh, Sarah, um, so Jane even uh, thought, considered having an abortion. In the end, she did have this uh, child, Sarah, but he had been the grandmother, Alice, to raise uh, Sarah, which means that Sarah, through her grandmother, had also lived in Un Paese di Carta. She had lived in this kind of an abstract entity uh, that, that uh, was Italy for her. And when she finally goes to Italy, she's faced with a reality that is very different from her expectations. And, and the reason that Sarah goes to Italy is because Alice has died. Uh, this happens relatively early in the novel, so we're not giving it's, away too much. It's not a spoiler. Too much. It's a, yeah, it's <laughs> Uh, but Sarah volunteers to take her grandmother's ashes back to L'Aquila, which is what Alice had requested. Um, so tell us about Alice. Yes, Alice, uh, I, did it in, I think one of, the, one of the scenes that I liked the most in the novel, or at least one of the scenes that I had the more fun uh, writing, is the scene of the, uh, the will, when the family uh, after uh, like a, of, uh, a lively uh, Thanksgiving dinner, the family uh, gets to read uh, uh, Alice's uh, last wishes, and one of them uh, is the fact that she wants her ashes to be scattered in her hometown in L'Aquila. And nobody really wants to do that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's expensive, uh, it's uh, time consuming, and all of that. And Sarah, who is only 18, uh, says, well, I, I'm going to do it, I'll go. And so she goes to, she goes to L'Aquila, and of course she, she realizes that she does not know before going, but she realizes as soon as she steps in L'Aquila that she is in a disaster zone. So in this way, Sarah's path crosses the whole problematic of the earthquake. And tell us more about Alice. Alice. Yeah. <laughs> Alice, uh, I think, well, th they really don't want to, s to, to reveal too much. Alice uh, is a librarian, so it's wonderful to, yes. have, uh, to yeah. talk about <laughs> Alice here. I was going here. to mention it, but I wanted you to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Alice is a, is a librarian, and since she's a librarian, literature plays a really a big role in, in this book, because she's a librarian and she lived in a country made, uh, made of paper. She's quite uh, a rebellious character, and in fact, we'll find out uh, towards the end of the novel that her choice to leave Italy was really a form of rebellion. She, had, uh, uh, sh she was born in 1930, so the f she had lived the first part of her life under fascism, and this is an experience that, that uh, deeply marked her and her family in ways that we discover towards the end of the novel. So the novel is also, there is also a little bit of a mystery to, to be solved. Why did Alice leave and why did Alice leave in, in those terms, uh, you know, without ever going back? This is something we find out. And uh, I wanted to ask, is it true, or did you find it to be true, as many novelists say, that your characters revealed themselves to you uh, more than you, you creating them? 
there is certainly some truth in that, absolutely, absolutely. This is, I mean, it is embarrassing, but I found some notes uh, for, about this novel from 1994. Unfortunately, they know fi computer files are merciless. I found some notes from 1994. Then, in, you know, so it took me a long time to, to, to write this novel. <laughs> and uh, the, um, yeah, it is absolutely true that I had basically had one idea in mind, the idea that I try to explain, the idea of Italy as a cultural construction. This is probably an idea linked to my uh, job, to my, uh, to, my, uh, to my work as a professor at Georgetown. I have, the, I have the privilege, really, of dealing with the best that Italy has produced uh, throughout the, the, the centuries. So I, I myself sometimes feel that I'm living in a, in a country made, made of paper. So I had this notion, this idea of uh, uh, the gap between Italy as a, cult a cultural construct and Italy as a political, a physical entity. And I had a scene, the first scene of, of the novel, or the first scene that I wrote uh, in the novel. And with these two, I, I was taking different paths and I was going nowhere until, I, until the novel and the characters really took that direction uh, the, 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 as I said, the, the A24 highway that leads from uh, Rome to L'Aquila, and the novel seemed to take its, its direction, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I may say, uh, add one more thing, then I, I, I so I started also, uh, I, I, I realized when uh, the, the novel took me to L'Aquila that I could not find a better metaphor for this idea of a country made of paper than what had happened to L'Aquila. So the contrast between L'Aquila with its past, its monument, and L'Aquila as basically a, an ugly suburb huh? <laughs> that, that has been, have been turned into by the earthquake. And if I do a little bit of an auto a self analysis, I also wonder uh, if this notion of un paese di carta uh, was so pressing to me at that point because I'd witnessed the destruction of the earthquake. And, and, and therefore, this idea of uh, the contrast between the Italy one dreams of and the real Italy was uh, appearing to me particularly poignant at that point mm -hmm. because of this, because of the earthquake. Right. And I think another contrast in the book, or maybe not contrast, but juxtaposition is between the past and the present. And you, you have this balance. And I know you have a, a reading uh, from your book that you'd like to do, and it, sh it shows this balance between the past and the present. Mm -hmm. Should I? Okay, I should, uh, should warn you that this is, so uh, I have translated, with Emily's help, I translated uh, a passage from uh, uh, the book uh, for this occasion. Uh, I actually, I adapted a passage of the book. Uh, this is the, uh, the central scene of the book, or, or the, the first scene in the book. Uh, it's uh, the scene of uh, Alice's death. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it deals with the past and present. Uh, so Alice is very ill at this point. She's eight years old, she's very ill. She uh, has a caretaker who comes to her place uh, but that particular day, the caretaker is late because you're not going to believe that there was a problem with Metro. <laughs> so uh, I know you're thinking now oh, this is science fiction, this cannot be, but uh, uh, you know, I thought it was plausible. Even in, 2000, in 2010, I thought, I thought it could happen someday. So the caretaker is late. Alice thinks this is her one chance to have one last uh, something. She doesn't know exactly what. But she leaves her house, uh, her home uh, in Bethesda, and she gets on the Capitol Crescent Trail. The Capitol Crescent Trail is this beautiful bike path that from Bethesda takes you all the way to Georgetown. So she starts walking along the path. The passage is a bit long. So the, the bad news is that the passage is a bit long. The good news is that it's the only passage that I'm going to read. So please <laughs> bear with me. The Capitol Crescent Trail, a bike path built over an old railroad, 
was crowded as usual at that time of day. Dogs, purebreds naturally, trotted along, tethered by their leashes to their proud owners. Young women unwilling to surrender to motherhood chased the dream of a perfect body, pushing their babies in jogging strollers. Commuters sped by on racing bicycles, sporting yellow windbreakers and streamlined helmets. The most determined among them carried the large saddlebags packed with important documents, a change of clothes, a couple of energy bars. Now and then, they glanced at their watches to make sure they were keeping up with themselves. On your left, they called out to warn pedestrians of their passing, but they shouted without animosity, out of habit. The most polite even found time to utter a distracted thank you as they rushed toward their offices on Massachusetts Avenue, in Georgetown, even on Capitol Hill. Alice was familiar enough with the Capitol Crescent Trail to know that it was rare to spot a couple holding hands, as if this place of affection were a waste of time. Everybody, from the moms to the commuters, seemed to be on a mission, to get in shape, to make the fastest commute, to reach the right level of cholesterol and blood sugar. <laughs> Suddenly, Alice found something obscene about taking her disease, her death, out for a walk. A bit like that old movie, Death Takes a Holiday. She wrapped herself in an oversized jacket and tried to look presentable. Watch out, on your left, somebody shouted, startling her. Perhaps without realizing it, she had veered into the center of the path. She decided to leave the pavement altogether and move to the gravel that ran next to it. Better, that was better. She could walk at her own pace with no fear of disrupting the traffic. That way, she could even try to go as far as the aqueduct tunnel and beyond. <coughs> Whatever happened, she thought, the excursion was an unexpected gift given the season. The gravel was irregular though. Alice walked carefully, her eyes fixed on the ground. At first, she did not notice the tall, dark figure walking beside her. Ne reminiscaris domine delicta nostra vel parentum nostrorum neque vindictam sumas de peccatis nostris. The voice was a little more than a whisper, but unmistakable. Sister Arcangela, Alice exclaimed. The figure kept talking as she walked, barely glancing at the book in her hands. Miserere mei domine quoniam infirmus sum, sana mei domine quoniam conturbata sunt ossa mea, et anima mea turbata es valdes, et tu domine us queco. Sister Arcangela, Alice called again. Yet, yes, it was she, with her threatening arcane Latin phrases that she recited with such devout stubbornness as if her salvation depended on their perfect articulation. It occurred to Alice that if she wanted to attract her attention, she needed to try something different, perhaps to speak the same language. She repeated the antiphony. Ne reminiscaris domine delicta nostra vel parentum nostrorum neque vindictam sumas de peccatis nostris. Sister Arcangela did not seem to notice Alice's presence, but waited until she finished before continuing her lines. Exaudevit dominus de precazione mea, dominus orazione mea suscepit. She was walking faster and faster. Alice tried to keep up, but soon fell behind. She screamed as if trying to shake off her weakness. Ne reminiscaris domine delicta nostra vel parentum nostrorum neque vindictam sumas de peccatis nostris. But Sister Arcangela's dark silhouette had already faded into the trees along the trail. Alice's words were scattered to the wind. Words scattered to the wind. Wasn't that a line from a poem? Yes, but not to one of my poems, said an animated voice at her side. You always mix things up, silly. But no, it's that other guy who wrote it. Shoot, I can't remember his name. Why are you looking at me like that? You are mad because I called you silly, aren't you? But it's not your fault, you are still a child. You actually know a lot of poems for a little girl. Alberto? <coughs> Why are you running so fast? And what are you doing with daddy's anti-rifle? Did you really believe I was going to shut up and obey the Germans? March where they told me to go, eins, zwei, eins, zwei, eins, zwei. Is that what you thought of me? You heard about the armistice, didn't you? What are they doing still here? Why don't they pack their bags and go home? 
What are they waiting for? You're right, Alberto. What are they doing here? But then, wait a minute. I'm coming with you. Come on now, you're being silly again. How can you possibly come with me when you are so little? All of a sudden, he seemed uncomfortable. He loosened the scarf around his neck, opened his jacket, and took out a big stack of papers held together by a purple ribbon. Listen, Alice, you gave me an idea. My poems. Why don't you keep them? They'll only weigh me down. He put the packet in Alice's hands and ran away, light on his feet. She tried to chase him, but quickly fell behind. Perhaps he was right. Perhaps she couldn't keep up. She couldn't even take care of his papers. One after the other, they escaped from the ribbon and flew along the path like fallen leaves. Had autumn come so soon? The pointless chase had taken Alice close to the entrance of the tunnel. The traffic of pedestrians and occasional cyclists had thinned out, and the path was empty except for a few late commuter bikers. To enter the tunnel, Alice would have to abandon the gravel and walk on the pavement in the dark. She wished that she had brought a flashlight. Perhaps if she hurried, though, no cyclist would enter the tunnel at the same time. She took a deep breath before diving into the darkness. She knew she could not rely on her eyes, and that the only way to stay straight was to use the wall as a handrail. She stretched out her fingers to, br to brush the side of the tunnel, felt the dirt and humidity under her nails focused on her breathing, and kept walking toward the light. A familiar presence sent shivers down her spine. It was Eric, with his torn jeans and his indigo t-shirt, smiling his ironic smile, his blonde head leaning slightly to one side. His thumb was out. He was asking for a ride. How could Alice say no? She slows down. Eric's smile is now victorious. He turns around and heads towards the river, as if he has forgotten about Alice. But she's tired of elusive encounters and fleeting ghosts, and without a second thought, she runs after him. The ground around the path is not landscaped. It is slippery, ragged, full of creepers, smooth moss, fallen trees. Alice loses her slippers, her flannel pajamas are torn and muddy. She scrapes her hands as she reaches out for branches, bushes, anything that might slow her descent toward the river. When she finally stops on the banks of the Potomac, Eric has disappeared. She tries to catch her breath as she looks around. The Potomac is still recovering from a rainy season. For weeks, its impetuous currents have carried and deposited the debris be left behind by the summer storms. Finally, in this mild beginning of fall, the river is returning to its normal, normal majestic course. Alice is mesmerized by the gaze of the sun on the water. Hi there. Unlike Alice, Herrick does not look tired at all. He smiles at her as he sits on the grass with his usual casual air, the expression of a man who is not yet home and is already planning his next journey. Long time no see, he reproaches her with a smile. I was beginning to think you'd never make it. She moves closer. I'm sorry I'm late, she thinks of telling him. I got distracted. Half a century goes by in the blink of an eye. Why don't you sit down? Alice bends over with great caution as they taught her at the clinic. First one knee, then the other. The sloping ground is tricky and she ends up flat on her back. She finds that she's not uncomfortable, but will she get back on her feet? They were all wrong, all of them. You were great. How is our little girl doing? She's fine, very well, actually. She's so beautiful, our Jane, so confident, so grown up. We are grandparents, you know. We have three grandchildren, and the eldest granddaughter is pregnant. We'll be great grandparents soon. She would like to tell him all of that, but she hesitates. How can one tell such things to a man in his 20s? She would not want to upset him. Eric lies down next to her. With his fingers, he caresses the grass. Alice is beaming with delight and trembling with fear. Now he will realize I'm old, she thinks. She's suddenly concerned about her looks, her age, the state of her pajamas. She leans on her elbow and lies on one side, surreptitiously checking her pants. She cannot believe what she sees. Her legs emerge from under a miniskirt, and they are firm and tanned, 
the legs of a person who has never set foot in a gym but has walked all over out of desire and curiosity. She has not seen those legs in a while and bends her knee just to watch the muscle flex under the tight, smooth skin. When she overcomes her surprise, she realizes that Eric has gotten very close, so close is practically leaning on her. Alice recognizes that unforgettable smell of wet underbrush and salty mist and follow his lips as they move towards hers until they are so close they become blurry. Kissing her with my soul upon the, my lips, it suddenly took flight. Tell us how you wrote that scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did I, 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 hope, I, I think this scene could be a, a little confusing because it's, uh, especially for those who haven't read the, 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 first, the first 50 page, pages leading to that scene, basically Alice sees the ghosts of the people who were very dear to her during her life. So first there is a, a nun, she studied with the nuns in, in, in L'Aquila, uh, then there is her, her brother, who is, was a, a partisan. And then there is Eric, the man uh, she loved and that, at whom she followed to the States. The scene, uh, so actually the scene, as you know, Emily, the scene is much, uh, uh, is, I mean, I was merciful. The, the scene is uh, uh, much longer <laughs> in the original because she, she meets other people. She sees uh, uh, other people. Uh, and the, the, the real, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, I had one notion, one concept, the Paese di Carta, the country made of paper, and I had one scene in mind, and this was the scene. And, uh, and probably, uh, in a way, this did have an autobiographical origin because I bike the Capital Crescent Trail almost every day to go to work. I think I biked the trail in every possible uh, weather. And there was you know, a particular day where it was very foggy and the, the few uh, people I managed to pass and the and the many people who were passing me uh, really looked like ghosts. I could only see them for a, for a few <laughs> seconds, and then they disappeared, sw sw you know, swallowed by, by the fog. So perhaps, uh, you know, that's how I, I got the, the inspiration. It's also, you know, it's, it's wonderful to bike the trail, but when you do it uh, several times a day, um, you know, a couple of twice a day, uh, several times a week, for several years, it does get a bit boring. So I, I think it's, you know, one But now, but you can think of Alice. But, but, but <laughs> so it's not but, boring at all. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But uh, so uh, Alice dies there uh, on the trail, but she does not leave the book. No. She, re re she remains a presence in the novel even after she has died. What was, tell us about that and what that was like. Yeah, uh, perhaps I'd, I'd, I really got a very uh, close to Alice, even in the, the, her sh short life I I in the book. So I just couldn't, couldn't bear myself to let her go. So after her death, she's still a presence, much with her. In fact, there is one of the chapters uh, that is titled After. And uh, much to her surprise, she discovers that sh although she has died, she can still follow the lives of the people around her. So in that little urn with her name, she's still something. And so she keeps being a presence in the book. And it is a, it is a very important presence uh, for me because Alice um, has a very ironic voice. And throughout the book, she develops this kind of yeah, sarcastic, even at times, ironic counterpoint to the uh, events in the lives of people uh, around her. So for instance, the, again, the, the scene of the will, she can actually, she's actually present because all the family is there when the will is, is open and she can really, she can really judge the reaction of, uh, of the people. And she's, she's present because her ashes are in the urn that is on the mantle, on in, the mantle. in the room Absolutely. where the will is being. On right. the mantle. And she has also a hard time adjusting to the mantle because her daughter, Jane, 
has accumulated all sorts of rubbish. You know, you know, our, our homes tend tend to be you know over overcrowded with things, and uh, this this mental piece in particular has you know the art glass, uh, the, the 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 fake. Uh, the fake uh, Murano glass, uh, all the all this kind of junk, and Alice has has problems trying to to affirm her difference from this this, this other junk that populates the the mental piece. So, the the, 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 the yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I want to ask a question about um, one of the parts of your reading. So you refer to Alberto, who is Alice's brother, and the Germans, and he's going off with a hunting rifle. What would this refers to the war, of course. What was happening in L'Aquila uh, during the war at this time? Just give some background. Yeah. Well, uh, L'Aquila, all, all of us, uh, I mean, yeah, I don't want to give a little history, history, history class, sorry, but ju just very, very briefly to introduce Alberto. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, L'Aquila, all of a sudden, found itself at the center of action in a way because. Now we're talking 1943, uh, Mussolini had resigned on July 20, uh, 25th, 1943, and had been made prisoner. So he had been put in a prison uh, near L'Aquila, in the mountains, in the Apennines, on the Gran Sasso. Then s September 8th, Italy signs the armistice with the Allies. September 12th, uh, the Germans free Mussolini from his prison in the Apennines. Mm. So uh, I the events were really going very, very fast. Everybody was very confused. The king had uh, flown uh, to the south. The allies were coming from the south. Uh, all of a sudden, L'Aquila was packed with Germans. Uh, and there had been this uh, announcement that, that all young men between age 18 and 25 had to be, uh, had to be registered. So people were afraid that that would mean, you know, that could mean a, a deportation, that could mean being forced to fight wi alongside with the Germans, and so on and so forth. So in, in this very confusing atmosphere, there were a group of young people from L'Aquila who on September 22nd left the town and went to the mountains, probably to start a partisan brigade or to reach other groups of partisans in the mountains. Uh, they were immediately captured. They were captured the day after. They were brought back to town, and nine of them were killed, were executed. Uh, so the, their death, their death well, this was per perhaps one of the first episodes of resistance in Italy, because again, you know, the, the, the armistice was only, was on September 8th, they were killed on September 23rd. Uh, there is a lot of mystery surrounding this episode, um, because the <coughs> news of their death was kept as a secret until the end of the war, until L'Aquila was liberated, uh, which happened on June 13th, 1944, so almost 10 months. 10 months uh, later. And it is still a mystery because, and I, I did not know this when I wrote the book, I found that, uh, I found out about this later. There was a trial after the, after the, the war in 1947, there was a trial about this episode, but the proceedings of the trial are kept secret for 70 years. So the trial was in 1947, now, next year, in 2017, we'll finally know what was established during that trial. Italy does not have the equivalent of Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. So they have this, uh, the, the judge can, uh, can, uh, you know, can say, can establish that uh, the proceedings can be kept uh, you know, mm -hmm. secret, they cannot be divulged to the public. I know that a journalist, um, tried to have access, petitioned to have access to the proceedings, and uh, he was unable to. I know of this case because the journalist published an article about this. I don't know how many other people tried to find out more about the trial and they were uh, you know, prohibited from doing so. Um, uh, the link with the, with the novel is that I imagine that uh, Alberto uh, 
was one of the uh, one one of the nine martyrs, as they are called in uh, in Italian, in Nove Martiri, who was killed in this uh, in this uh, circumstance. So he's a, an imaginary character, but he combines the characteristics of uh, of some of this uh, of uh, of this uh, nine heroes. Uh, the young age, Alberto is only seventeen. Uh, and love for poetry. One of the one of the nine had already published a book of poetry. Mm -hmm. the uh, The youngest was seventeen. The oldest was uh, twenty one years old. Mm -hmm. So, in, in this way, the 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 story of the the, the, the Alice and uh, and uh, Sarah uh, intersects with the with the history of the of the town. Mm -hmm. And and what although we don't know for sure what happened. I've gathered from you that one of the suggestions uh, is that perhaps these young men were betrayed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 there are several issues that are not clear. Uh, why were they captured so soon? Why uh, was the news over their death kept as a secret? Um, so there are many things that are not are not clear, and uh, uh, Walter Cavalieri, a historian who wrote about this, says that they were killed, they were captured and killed uh, not only by the Germans but also by uh, Italian fascists. But if we are talking about Italian fascists in a small town, we are talking about uh, the neighbor, uh, mm -hmm. the cousin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, relatives. So it's really a, a, a burning, a burning um, issue. So there I had some room to maneuver, you know, I could use what Torquato Tasso calls the license to invent, and I could offer a, a hypothesis uh, about, a, a hypothesis about the, the, the reason why they were captured so soon. So in the book there is a, a, a totally fictional hypothesis, but uh, that uh, is coherent with the historical framework. Wait, and I, don't, I don't know if, if I'm being clear. Huh? I mean, but this, uh, but yeah. And so early, early Please ex about explain this for me. I was, I'm not being very clear. No, Help. no, this is. Help. No. Right. Um, so going back to the point about how Alice, uh, even after, after her death, when she is now in cremated ashes, she's still aware of what's happening, and she, she comments on what she sees. Well, when Sarah, her granddaughter, takes the ashes back to L'Aquila as as Alice had, had wished, she sees the state of the city. And she, so the, the late Alice makes this observation that even the war hadn't hit Lakula in the way that the earthquake did. And maybe that's obvious, but this really struck me because you think about World War II being so monumental and so catastrophic in every possible way. And here in the span of a couple of seconds, with the earthquake, what Alice sees is this has done. This has hurt Lachlan more. I, I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that. Did you have that sense when you went back to Lachlan after the earthquake and saw it, or do you think this is true? Well, it's certainly in the case of Lachlan, it, it, it is true because uh, uh, because Lachlan, there were there was a, an area in Lachlan near the train station that was bombed, but uh, apart from that, apart from that. Um, the, 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 the city was largely spared by, uh, by World War II. So definitely the devastation in L'Aquila has always happened because of the earthquakes, historically. From, uh, uh, you know, uh, L'Aquila has had earthquakes throughout its, its history. So uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, it is true. Um, what has changed? Uh, in the reaction to the earthquakes, uh, though, is very, uh, is very interesting, I think. There is a passage in the, in the novel. So uh, Sarah goes to L'Aquila and uh, finds that she is uh, in a disaster zone, and she was not prepared to that. And she uh, meets a young uh, man from L'Aquila uh, who is very active in uh, trying to promote a responsible uh, rebuilding process. And this young man says, uh, at some point, explains to Sarah the, uh, the, a little bit of the history of the, of the city. And he says that 
uh, L'Aquila has always suffered from earthquakes, and there was, in particular, a very strong earthquake less than a century after the town was built. But in that case, the lord of the town immediately sent out, you know, sent soldiers to all the gates to prevent the population from leaving the city. <laughs> so, <laughs> because the town had, uh, was a recent town, and uh, actually the, the people, uh, uh, we, uh, the citizens of, of the town, came from various villages around the town. So they were ready to, to go back. And the lord of the town said, no way, you, are, you stay here and you rebuild. And now this young man, Alessandro, says, now this time the opposite happened. This time the government has intervened to lock the town off from the citizens. So in other words, the entire town has been declared as a disaster zone and people are being forced to move away, to go away from the town. So we no longer have a, you know, a centripetal force, we have a centrifugal uh, force. And uh, I think there's a, an interesting theme uh, in the book. The book is also a snapshot of the situation in L'Aquila at a particular point of the reconstruct of the rebuilding process uh, in the years, you know, 2010, 2011, when nothing was happening, and it was only the 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 the, the, the activity, the rebellion of the people from L'Aquila that allowed the, the the rebuilding process to to start. Uh, Alessandro is. I imagine Alessandro, although there, there is no, it's not mentioned in the book, mentioned in the book, but I imagine Alessandro like one of, of the people of, of the wheelbarrows. I, I wrote an article in the post uh, about that. So the people who, after uh, a year of inactivity, forced their entrance into the center of town only to discover that nothing was being done, that there was still rubble, that not, nothing was happening. So. I think probably I went uh, far away with the That's okay, proper no. question. But, <laughs> but, she mentioned the but, you, but you have been my students, so you are not surprised <laughs> by this kind of <laughs> No? Um, <laughs> I, I want to add this, and she mentioned it, it, is, it is true that she, I, I, I remember when this happened, she wrote an article for the Post when the uh, earthquake happened in L'Aquila, and then one year after on the anniversary. And I went back and read them, these two articles mm -hmm. before today, and they're, of course, it's nonfiction, they're essays and commentaries, but, but you can look them up, they'll, they'll be online, and many of the ideas that Laura wrote about in those articles surface uh, in, in various mm. ways in, in the novel. So if you're interested, they're, they're there. Um, mm. I wanted to say, in, in many ways, the book is about grief and loss. Mm. You have Alice who loses her, the way of life as she knew it after the war. You have Sarah who loses her grandmother when she dies. You have the people of L'Aquila who lose their town uh, in the earthquake. But in spite of all of that, it feels to me like a hopeful book. And I wonder if you agree, and if you do, why? Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. In fact, I'm always afraid of this. When I talk about the book, I'm always afraid that the book sounds more, um, you know, more, it sounds a bit de depressing. Well, well to me, it, it's, it's not. It's not. It's <laughs> not. It's not. Because in the end, um, sure, there is grief and there is loss, uh, but uh, in the end, the, the, the force, you know, communication wins over silence. The memory is preserved. Uh, so in the end, I think that there are human forces that manage to overcome the obstacles. In particular, I'm thinking, so Sarah has to fulfill this mission, has to scatter uh, her grandmother's ashes in L'Aquila. But really, her real mission is to understand her grandmother's history, to establish that continuity between past and present. And it is at that point that Alice can really die, you know, because she has uh, accomplished her, her mission. And, uh, she, and so I think there is, there is, after all, a positive, a positive tone in the book, and a bit tone in, in, in the book, after all. Yeah. And there are many passages that I had a, you know, a lot of fun writing, and I hope the readers have, a, have some, some fun reading. Yeah. And wh wh what you said about um, Sarah, Sarah learning more about her grandmother's life and finally understanding why it was that she had left Italy, it reminded me of a conversation we had a, a long time ago, and we were talking about, about the war in Italy, and you said that there was 
you, you made this observation that so much gets lost mm. between generations and in particular between parents and children. Absolutely. And that's what you said. And here you have a granddaughter who has this very profound relationship with her grandmother. And I wondered if when you were writing the novel, you thought about this, um, everything that does get lost between generations oh, or that yes, can be re recuperated as Sarah did. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yes, there, there is a lot, absolutely. I, I mean, you probably, with your work about uh, victims of the Holocaust, you also have found this, that sometimes people who have gone through a traumatic experience don't necessarily want to talk about that, or, or they talk about that in ways that uh, the younger generations are not ready to, 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 to hear. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking there was a, that beautiful short story by Giorgio, uh, Giorgio Bassani about uh, about that on a lapid in the Amazzini, but, but anyway. Uh, the, so uh, there is a lot that, that, that gets lost, uh, but there are also ways to, to recuperate that. I think that sometimes, in, particularly in this, this uh, genealogy, uh, granddaughter, mother, uh, I never know how to say, basically, basically the, 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 the daughters, so in this case Jane, sometimes it's the weak, it's the weak, a link. link. Sometimes I find I find that even sometimes with, with students, sometimes uh, we have. A, a, uh, well, I, if I give you, can, if I can give you yet another pointless anecdote, <laughs> I'll tell you that, for instance, uh, 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 at, at Georgetown, at graduation a, a few years ago, there was a, a woman, uh, a young woman, a student, uh, a major, an Italian uh, major. Uh, who came uh, with uh, her mother and her grandmother, and uh, the mother could not speak any Italian, and the grandmother was from mm -hmm. Italy. So basically, uh, really, the, gran the, 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 the younger person had managed to recuperate the, 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 you know, the, the heritage of the older generation. This is something that we see fairly, fairly often, I'd, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there was a little bit about that. Um, so I want to come back to Alice. Uh, why did you make her a librarian? We're asking this because <laughs> we're at the, at the library. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking, uh, uh, it just came that way. I don't, I don't know. I was thinking this a person who loved literature. At the beginning, when she moves to the States, she has to do other jobs. She works in stores, etc. But at some point, cause, uh, somewhat triumphantly, uh, triumphantly, she writes this letter saying uh, that I'm finally uh, a librarian and I'm even organizing, organizing language classes. I, d I, d I don't know. Uh, perhaps it was, uh, it was in keeping with the idea of uh, Un Paese di Carta. She's a librarian with a, with a passion for, for uh, languages and, and uh, Literature, and and in particular, she so she loves uh, Alice loves Italian li literature. She loves Russian literature, Russian poetry. Uh, these, by the way, are all characteristics of, of Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'm going to tell you, uh, it's not a pointless anecdote. There is there is a point. <laughs> there were no pointless anecdotes. So I took a number of classes that Laura taught at Georgetown, and one of them was a course on contemporary Italian poetry. And it was so great. It was great because every day we would go to class and she would read the, the, the poems. And it was, it was just fantastic to listen to her read them. I looked forward to it every week. So then, at a certain point, Lara decides that it's time for the students to learn to recite these poems in Italian. And all the fun went away because <laughs> we weren't good at it. I mean, there were no Italians in the class. We didn't speak Italian that well. It was horrible to listen to these poems. <laughs> And so the class just wasn't that much fun after, after Lara stopped reading the poems. So since everyone is here, even if you don't speak Italian, I assume that you're interested in Italian because you're at this event. And so I'm taking advantage and I'm, I'm gonna ask Lara to read a poem here. And this, this poem figures, it's a, it's a very short passage, it figures in the book. So could you first, um, you don't have to translate it, but explain to us who wrote this and what it's about, and then would you read this to us? Yeah, we hadn't prepared this, as we should have. <laughs> the <laughs> so it's a passage in the book, and uh, uh, at some point, Sarah in L'Aquila meets uh, her grandmother, so Alice's fiance, whom Alice had left oh. when she decided to move to the States. And the, the, the fiance is also linked with the, the other story about the, the war. 
But anyway, the fiancé is, of course, also a, a passionate reader of literature. And the way uh, Sarah manages to take the, the secrets out of this old man is by reciting poems. Uh, um, uh, so she recites some Russian poetry. And then the, the really the breaking point in when she, when she reads this, when she recites, because uh, I imagine that Sarah has an extraordinary memory. And uh, so she recites this passage from uh, Torquato Tasso's uh, Jerusalem Liberata, Jerusalem Delivered, where in the very final, in the very final battle, uh, Solomon, one of the one of the characters, is climbs a tower, and from the tower he looks at the what Tasso calls the great theater of human life, the great uh, place of chance and destiny. And this is really the breaking point because this old man, like you know, all of us, perhaps the more the more we age, the more we wonder about these things. Uh, it really wonders. So. W was it chance? Was it destiny? Why did things happen in the way they happened? Could things go any, any differently? And this is the passage. Or mentre in guisa tal fera tenzone e tra fedele esercito il pagano, salsa in cima alla torre ad un balcone e mirò, benché lunge, il fier soldano. Mirò, quasi in teatro o di nagone, l'aspra tragedia dello stato umano i vari assalti e il fero orror di morte, e i gran giochi del caso e della sorte. So see why we, we missed that when she stopped. <laughs> when she stopped. <laughs> Do you have a translation for that? No. 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 <laughs> you Luis, can go home and look it up. <laughs> can you improvise a translation? We have a wonderful <laughs> translator here, Luis Epwell, but, uh, no. but she's not working today. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, 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 that's the, the, the yeah, the, it, it's I really. I think you, you got this. Exactly, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to si save uh, plenty of time for questions. Mm -hmm. So um, please, I know Lara is happy to answer any questions you might have. Don't be bashful. So uh, please explain, this is all very interesting, please explain where you, your early life in Italy, uh, and uh, where you grew up, and how you decided to write about this particular uh, area, section of, of Italy on, in, in, the, uh, in the hills, mm -hmm. in the Apennines. Yeah, I am from L'Aquila. I am from L'Aquila. I grew up there. I went to high school there. Then I studied in Rome. And then from Rome, I, I went first to Canada, then, then came to the US to study. Then I lived in Paris for a while. Then I came back to the US to, uh, to work. And um, and uh, I, I think this is actually my uh, uh, personal limitation that I have. Uh, it is impossible for me to write about places that I, that I don't know personally. I mean, recently I was trying to, to, to write, I was writing something and I wanted, I wanted uh, to uh, just to have a, a small scene in a small Italian town. So in order not to have everything happen in L'Aquila, because mm -hmm. L'Aquila is a small town, it, it, it seems kind of absurd that everything happens there. I was thinking of Viterbo. I thought comparable town, almost the same size, provincial town. I wasn't able to have characters take, you know, have a cup of coffee in Viterbo, you know, take a bus in Viterbo, absolutely, I mean, as if they were, you know, on the moon, I mean, and I could, I could not picture anything. So in a way, uh, the novel is obviously not autobiographical, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, geographically autobiographical. I talk of places that, uh, that I know. I live in Bethesda. <laughs> I live in Bethesda. I know L'Aquila fairly well. And even there is also another trip to the, to the Western United States, to, to Utah. And that's a place which I don't know very well, but which uh, I visited and I, I like very much. So. Perhaps if that only has to do with my personal limitations as an author. There are a lot of Italians from uh, Abruzzo, many Abruzzesi that immigrated. Can you talk a little bit about why so many from that part of Italy that came here? Well, it was a very 
it, it was a very poor part of Italy, especially my part of, of Abruzzo, so really the, the Apennines, those villages used to, uh, in fact, uh, when you go there, you see some uh, ghost uh, villages where they, they, they were uh, extremely, extremely poor. There's uh, this beautiful novel by Ignazio Silone, Fontamara, uh, takes place during the fascist years, but also uh, deals a lot with the, like, the historical reasons why, why the, this part it, it was so poor. But also geographically, there aren't a lot of resources. Uh, it's very hard, you know, the, 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 the land is very barren. Uh, so that, that's why you find a lot of people from Abruzzi, but especially from the province of, of L'Aquila, from that, that, that area. Who have who have left? And we left absolutely. You, you call. You call. Okay, you are you're in charge. <laughs> She's in charge. Excuse me. I didn't come here with any special expectations, but the novel seemed the perfect gift for a friend I have in uh, Santa Monica, who is from Azo. But uh, I'm not clear. Is the book for sale when you leave? No, not is not here. Is it for sale in the U.S. or? It's a, a, a book. Sorry for the for sorry for the commercial the commercial mm -hmm. pitch, but the, the book uh, can be ordered by a variety of, of, of um, uh, you know uh, sites like uh, Amazon. Uh, all in of the all US? Uh, uh, in the U.S., I found that the best way the best way and again this is a site I'm not a, at all you know connected with. I don't get a percentage from it, but the best site is bookdepository.com because they ship anywhere in the world without shipping charges. And the price is, is, is very good because the price is you know, 13 euros uh, in Italy. It's, they charge $15. So it's really a fair, a fair you know, conversion. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way I've found to, to, you know, to order books from the US. And uh, one last question. Since, <coughs> since you had so much trouble with the title, Uh, uh, well, now this inspired me actually. This work that we did from Emily. <laughs> <laughs> she looks at me with, with <laughs> fear because you know, <laughs> there, there are two people, Luis and Emily, who have to fear my my uh, my ambitions uh, with, with with English. But anyway, the uh, the uh, I, I am working on a translation. Yes, but it's not for the near future. So I would, if somebody can read Italian, I would go with the with the Italian. Until Emily has, uh, unless Emily has a lot of spare time. And, uh, <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Benedetti, what, um, tell us a little bit about your movement from Harvard to Georgetown and sort of a comparison as a graduate in linguistics from Georgetown. I'd be interested in the comparison of the two, two <laughs> wonderful universities. Well, you know, to be honest, perhaps the, the, the simplest way to explain this is that my daughter just started college at Georgetown. And, uh, and uh, you know, we always thought, uh, my husband also, also taught at Harvard, and uh, we always thought that, uh, uh, that uh, Georgetown does an excellent job. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I can add any, anything. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anything. More questions? Feel free. Go ahead. Dr. Benedetti, um, can you comment on uh, like how it was living in a country that there were also living in Paris and the capital of the old country? How did these two backgrounds personally did it in her personality and did they make her stronger or did it present some downsides? Mm -hmm. D definitely, she definitely uh, had some problems adjusting, uh, and but I, I thought that more than uh, yeah, it's interesting. She had some problems adjusting, but since I don't go too much into her life, uh, this is the, 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 the like the, the 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 clash of cultures is not it's not really analyzed as far as Alice is concerned, but there is more of a discussion of that when Sarah goes to Italy. At that point, since Sarah has lived in a, a paese a, di carta as well, because she has learned the Italian that her grandmother taught her, so she has 
uh, uh, she has several uh, problems uh, already using a language that is way too elegant and refined for contemporary Italians. Mm -hmm. So she speaks Italian very well, but her Italian is somewhat literary. Uh, or adjusting to the various uh, Italian habits and idiosyncrasies, you know, you know, but, you know, several. So, so uh, Sarah was very important to me because she allowed me to um, show a country and also the, the earth situation of the earthquake uh, as if I were seeing it for the first time. Again, the, you know, the Russian formalists call this ostranenie, so o or estrangement, having a, a character who is new to a certain situation and therefore allows a writer to present a situation as if it had been this, he or she were seeing it for the first time. So it's Sarah more than uh, Alice who, uh, who deals with the with the with deals with the t the two words Ab absolutely. Go ahead. No, it's very can, can I just add, I, I, I love that question because it's a beautiful part of the, the book. And I had made a note, another example, you were mentioning the subjunctive, and at another point, Alice talks about the passato remoto. Passato remoto, yes. Um, which is a yes. one form of the past tense in. Uh -huh. Which does not exist in English. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and which sort of, w w something that Alice is saying is it's falling into disuse in Italy, even though it's so elegant and, con and conveys mm -hmm. meaning beyond what the sort of the normal past tense would. And so I had written this down. Um, so Al I, it's a is it Alice who says that when the people who don't, who, who don't use the passato remoto, who don't use this tense, that they lose a dimension of, the, of their past. They're like the Romans who stopped using the future tense and they lost their empire. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 so there are two examples, and yes, uh, absolutely. In Paese di Carta, it's also uh, it's also the, uh, the language, uh, uh, absolutely. And in fact, when I uh, when I started translating the book, I, I stopped precisely the the passato remoto because I did not know how to get around this problem. Uh, it's true because language is very central. It's very central uh, in the novel. So that the particular case of the passato remoto. So the passato remoto is this form of the past that they use in Italy. So the remote past that they use in Italy. And it's a very also literary noble uh, uh, past. And the, the scene where this is uh, d becomes important is during the last evening that. Uh, Alice spends with Jane. Alice dies the day, the day after. And Alice, since she loves languages, when Jane, her daughter, goes to, to visit her, she says, well, you know, I don't want to pray, because uh, Alice is also fiercely in, in, you know, secular in her approach to life. Uh, but let's recite some conjugation. Let's recite some passato remoto. <laughs> And Jane, Jane has a very conflictual relation, not only for her, with her daughter, but also with, with her mom. She says, ah, oh, you know, at the end of a day at work, now here I am, <laughs> you know, struggling with this thing. And, but Alice insists, and so she says, you know, she starts with the, to be born in the passato remoto, uh, then uh, to grow up, uh, then love and die. That's, the, that's how that chapter ends with the uh, Yomori, Tumoristi, and so on and so forth, with the passato remoto, the conjugation of the passato remoto. 
it's important. It's not just a, a, a grammar point. It's not just a grammar point. Uh, Alice is afraid of that the past, her experience, her entire life goes lost. And that's why I was saying that the, the book is a, is a positive book, because in the end, Sarah does manage to, to reconstruct the story. So the passato remoto is, is not lost. So it, it, it's not, it's not a, a, an erudite, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a trivial grammar point. It's really essential to the way the character sees the, the, the world and also to the way the novel is, is, is constructed. It is, it's going to be very challenging to do that in English. So in fact, I'll, there had to be another, another, another novel altogether, perhaps. Yeah, I, yeah, I haven't come across. I haven't come across a possible solution, solution to, uh, to that. Or there is another passage uh, when uh, Alice writes to uh, the man, her fiancé in Italy, the, the only letter that she writes to her fiancé in Italy, uh, she says she, she gets really, uh, really interested in another tense, the, the past conditional. And she says, there are some languages that don't have the past conditional. Apparently, this is true. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore, you cannot say, oh, if I had not gone to England, I would be a happy person now. You cannot say that. Once you have not gone to England, <laughs> you cannot resurrect that possibility even for uh, like a rhetorical game. It, uh, you know. and, uh, and so uh, Alice says, so we should do the same thing, you know, and, uh, and I abolish the conditional past. I don't want to, I don't want to think about what would have happened if I had stayed, if I had stayed. So, so there are many observations like that, but, but the conditional past work, works in English as well, but the passato remoto is probably doomed to disappearance. <laughs> no? <laughs> For questions. Comment and a question. A comment about the issue of the lost that we talked about, that you guys talked about. I actually found instead uh, a, a green book that is actually a novel of uh, discovery and recovery. Mm -hmm. Discovery because with Sarah, we get to know the past of Alice, her, her life, or what probably Jamie didn't even know. So we get reconnected. And then the recovery from Alice, that she actually goes back to a place uh, after her death, uh, and we discover the, this new city, the L'Aquila, and then she gets reconnected to it. So I found it really positive mm -hmm. uh, in this sense. And then my question is Alice. Uh, Alice, that for me is a very um, uh, interesting character, and uh, I love her, and I, it feels so realistic. Like I really, when I read the book, I felt like she was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, she is connected to ev events in Italy that actually happened here. So uh, we, we get to know history, some the part of history in the book. Uh, just to make it short, I didn't know anything about the nine martyrs uh, when I read before reading the book. So when I read the book, I thought there was like, I don't know this. So I looked it up on the internet and I saw a video. I watched a video about a lady who actually was there the day that those nine kids, uh, young people, were captured. And uh, I said, oh, she must have known Alice. <laughs> <laughs> she was so, it was so, for me, Alice was so realistic that I actually thought she was a real person. <laughs> so my question is, uh, who is Alice? <laughs> like, who inspired you to write? No, 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 no. I don't. I, I don't have totally any anyone. Fictional. Yeah, it's to totally fictional. But, uh, but, uh, but as I said, she became very real, and perhaps that's why I could not abandon her. But no, there is no, there is no, there is no, no, no inspiration. No, 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 no real person who inspired, who inspired that. Mm -mm. Yeah. Is there time for one more question? Yeah. Sure, of course. Yeah, Wait, let, let, let's uh, hear his question and then... Um, I have a question. I, you mentioned this taking a long time to write. Uh -huh. I was just wanting to, I was just wondering, uh, you talked about 94, you found notes from, I was wondering what kind of, if your 
thinking has changed? What has changed over the years that has given you insight into maybe the characters or the Paisa di Carta? I'm just mm -hmm. wondering the evolution of the thinking mm -hmm. on this. The, the notes from 1994 were actually about the, the Thanksgiving dinner. There is one point, so this family, it like, you know, it's like all families, it's a bit dysfunctional, you know? <laughs> so they all find together around the Thanksgiving uh, table and there are some tensions. And this w was the part that I was trying to, uh, a completely different setting though. This is the idea I was working on uh, in uh, 1994, a very, almost a theatrical piece uh, although I wanted to, I mean, I intended to write a, a novel, uh, a family, you know, everybody's there with their little things, and there is one person who is ill and would like to tell everybody, but at the end of the day, she does not manage to, to say anything, which in the novel is Jane. Jane thinks he, she's ill. Actually, she, then she's not. She's not ill a, a, at all, but she thinks she's ill, but she doesn't have the, then the, fam the you know, the, the conversation at the, the dinner table goes, go, goes completely crazy because uh, Sarah has some big revelations for everybody. Anyway, everything goes wrong and she does not manage to say anything. But those were the notes that I found for 1984 that somehow then, then, uh, then uh, merged uh, with the rest, uh, with the rest of, of the novel, the novel it, it itself. Uh, when I started really writing it, I wrote it with those different bricks from different uh, times. In a relatively short time, six or seven months, I'd written the novel. The, the rest was just revising it and, uh, and uh, trying to to make it more to make the characters more believable. I think you have another question. Uh, one more. One more Yes, I go back to the uh, theme of rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that Amist uh, is a rebel, uh -huh. right? And so is Sarah. And uh, in between, we have Jane, uh, who is not a rebel. She uh -huh. is uh, a rather conformist uh, type of character. But um, Alice uh, and Sarah rebel in uh, a similar way. Um, Alice runs out, uh, runs away with, uh, with the men. And um, this connotes a certain uh, period of time. Uh, at that time, it was uh, a very rebellious thing to do. Um, nowadays, it's not. It's <laughs> very normal, very uh, you mm -hmm. know, um, everyday occurrence. Uh, you don't have to run away. You can uh, just live next door with uh, uh, a partner. Mm -hmm. But um, so Sarah rebels in a different way. She has a relationship with a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the our time, it's yeah, uh, not so normal yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it, is this something you have in mind um, to create a parallel between the two of them with a similar, uh, um, let's say, breakaway that uh, connotes to their rebellion? Yeah. There's definitely some spiritual affinity between uh, Alice uh, and uh, and Sarah. Definitely, they are they are both uh, they are both uh, rebellious. The um, my idea was that so the story is that Sarah is sent for a gap year out west because she has several problems, especially she likes alcohol a bit too much. And there, it, the, the the story of uh, her discovery of her homosexuality was really almost came from the landscape, you know, from the, mm -hmm. the Arches <laughs> Natural Park where she, uh, National Park where she, where she is, you know, with all the, the curves mm -hmm. of, the, of that area. She discovers a completely, pa a completely different part of her country. She is very much, uh, 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 Sarah is very much a product of the East Coast and uh, she finds herself in a completely different landscape and uh, as part of that discovery, she also has this relationship with a woman, who, uh, uh, which then the relationship then creates some tension in the family. But some tension that is also almost imagined. By Sarah is also trying, always trying to find reasons to to gather her mother. Uh, so although poor Jane keeps telling her, "Look, I couldn't care less," you know, mm -hmm. I really this is not this is you know. 
uh, this is the, the third millennium and so on and so on and so forth. But Sarah wants to have one more reason to, to make her mother upset. So, and I thought, I, I thought actually that the, the, uh, this interaction between uh, Jane and, uh, and Sarah uh, I, I really kept me uh, very, very busy, but, uh, but, I, but it's, uh, I think that, that poor Jane caught between these two rebels is actually uh, any, uh, an interesting, important character. On, uh, it's just much more generous, for instance, much more open-minded that uh, the, the two, uh, you know, the, the old one and the young one would believe, the, believe she, she is. So. Well, I am sorry, but we have to conclude here. I think it was a wonderful uh, presentation of this novel in, in English for the first time. I, so I'm very proud about that. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Benedetti. Thank you, Emily. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.